Hello, my name is Megan Bell, and I'm the president of the Waterloo Region Association of Realtors. On Monday, October 24th, voters from across Waterloo Region will have the opportunity to vote in the upcoming municipal election. This forum is your chance to get to know some of the candidates and learn where they stand on issues that matter to you. As a resident of Waterloo Region and a realtor, I know that housing is one of the most critical concerns facing our community. And our members, like many of you, want to hear how our municipal leaders plan to help solve this crisis. Far too many people in our community are finding it nearly impossible to find a place that they can afford, in the neighborhoods they care for, grew up in, or want to raise their families in. Some are even being forced to consider other cities or provinces. Municipal leaders play a key role when it comes to housing and developments within the community. They have the ability to ensure that more homes and different housing types can be built easier and come to market faster. And they can be key in making sure people don't face further restrictive measures to home ownership, such as a municipal land transfer tax as they have in Toronto. On behalf of the nearly 2,500 members of the Waterloo Region Association of Realtors, I want to thank all of the candidates for taking part in this forum and our local Chamber of Commerce for hosting. We look forward to hearing from all of you and wish you all the best in the election. Hi everyone, and thank you for viewing the Greater Kitchener, Waterloo and Cambridge Chambers of Commerce Candidate Forum for Mayor of the Township of Woolwich. I'm James Sebastian Scott from City News 570 and I'll be moderating the discussion today. The Chamber would like to thank the newly formed Waterloo Region Association of Realtors for their support of this event. And we trust the upcoming exchange of policy positions will assist you in making informed choices around your vote on October 24th. The format will include questions on issues of particular concern for businesses and employers across the region. However, we expect that all viewers will find the content uh, informative and engaging. The alphabetical candidate order for one minute opening remarks and question responses is Patrick Merlihan to start and then Sandy Schantz uh, to conclude. At the conclusion of questions, Sandy Schantz will provide closing remarks followed by Patrick Merlihan. Patrick, please proceed with your opening statement. Hi, my name is Patrick Merlihan. I'm running to be Woolwich Township's next mayor in the October 24th election. I'm an active and engaged member of council and since first being elected in 2014. Both my professional and public experience has demonstrated myself to be an excellent candidate to bring a fresh, modern perspective that residents in Woolwich Township are looking for. I'm an entrepreneur owning a successful communications business for the past 26 years. I have been a member of the Almira Chamber and then KW Greater Chamber since 1996. I'm an avid reader of business and leadership books. I'm informed and seek out information and opinions about issues from people that know better than myself. I'm aware of small business concerns because I am a small business owner, like many of the members here at the Chamber. I know the frustration of business incentives and grants that are announced by all levels of government, only to find out in the fine print that you once again won't qualify. Local politicians need to recognize the changing environment the businesses are finding themselves in this fast-paced world that we now exist in. Local government has to be able to become more responsive to business interests or see the consequences of their inaction. I've spoken to businesses of all sizes that are frustrated with the slow or non-response to issues. Some are even contemplating moves out of the region as an easier solution to their expansion needs here. This attitude needs to change because it is and will cost everyone in the long run. We have some of the best companies in tech, agriculture, manufacturing, and small businesses thriving here in Waterloo Region, and I will be an advocate and promoter of enterprise here wherever I go. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. We'll now go to Sandy with her opening remarks. Thank you, and thank you to the Greater KW Chamber of Commerce and the Waterloo Region Association of Realtors for the opportunity to answer a few of your questions this morning. I am Sandy Schantz, and I'm asking for the privilege of serving another term as mayor of the Township of Woolwich. With a projected increase in growth and cost of living and building costs more than ever, we need leaders who can listen to all sides, connect the dots, and empower those around to step up to the plate. Just a very quick example, because a minute's a very short time. Uh, when our towns grow, we need, to, we need increased services to support that growth. 
Development fees fund those increased services. If we reduce those fees, either those services do not get provided or the existing homeowners have to pay with increased property taxes. So without partnering with our business community, our philanthropists and senior levels of government, municipal government cannot solve the housing or climate crises that we're faced with. We need to work together. I've had my voice heard on the board of Waterloo North Hydro and the new, <coughs> excuse me, Anova Energy. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry, the new Inova Energy, the Airport Master Plan Committee, Integrated Regional Transportation Advisory Committee, and the Homelessness and Housing Steering Committee, to name a few of the places my influence has been seen in the last four years. I listen, I can connect the dots. The pandemic put a number of initiatives on hold, and as we prepare to update our strategic plan and our official plan, um, I want to bring those skills to the leadership of the township and the region. And I apologize for my phone ringing in the background. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. I will now go to the question portion of the forum here. Uh, and the first question, uh, first answer that we'll get will be from uh, Sandy. Uh, based on your recent discussions with voters, what is the priority issue in this election? I think there are three priority issues. Um, first is, is safe, accessible, and healthy communities. And uh, by that, I refer to safe in the broad sense, feeling safe in the community. Also, uh, traffic concerns. Uh, once again, this morning, I had an email about a traffic concern in one of our settlements. Yesterday at uh, the region, I asked for a report on uh, on a, a, a strategy to reduce traffic uh, speeding in our settlements because it's a real concern. The second one would be the environment. That is a, a key uh, issue for people in our communities and providing adequate housing at all levels. We need housing, affordable housing. We need housing right across the, the continuum, right up to, uh, to condos. I know people in the township who've had to leave. Uh, to find their next level of housing, and they've moved to the city, so we've lost some very, uh, very good community members in that regard. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, Patrick, based on your recent discussions with voters, what's the priority issue in this election? Uh, yeah, and the priority is uh, housing, definitely. Uh, I hear, I'm hearing that a lot at the doors. Uh, the other day, I uh, I just happened to be in Bloomingdale when a couple was moving into their uh, parents' backyard into a trailer uh, just coming into winter. Uh, they've been uh, bumped out of the housing market. Uh, so that one's, uh, that one's real fresh uh, with people and lots of discussion. Um, environmental leadership is uh, something that I've championed uh, since my time on council. Uh, I've brought a lot of initiatives uh, to uh, Woolwich Township, including 0.5% uh, increase uh, levy to start funding uh, some of the initiatives that we need to do because there wasn't a uh, budget line item that would take on any of these projects. So uh, that was, uh, environment is definitely uh, up there and of concern of the young people and uh, everybody in our communities are, are talking about it. Uh, the other uh, big issue is about uh, connections in our community and uh, that uh, there's, you know, depending, a, a lot of communities outside of Elmira are not feeling very connected to their township, but the connections to each other, uh, you know, neighborhoods that don't communicate with each other and people not feeling safe because we, there has been late uh, news as of late uh, in our township of not being very welcoming and not inclusive. Uh, so those are the things that uh, this past week as a council, we passed a motion uh, asking for uh, training for a committee of council uh, to deal with inclusivity and diversity and, um, and uh, also to start looking at uh, projects uh, within the community to have wider education about that problem. So uh, connections is definitely a, a top priority uh, at the door. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, the next question, we will begin with Patrick on this one. Currently, Toronto is the only municipality in the province that has a municipal land transfer tax. 
The additional municipal tax is a significant barrier for people trying to get into the market, particularly for first time buyers. Over the last several years, there have been municipalities that have tried to give themselves the MLTT powers. Do you support the expansion of those powers to municipalities outside of Toronto? And would you advocate against our community gaining those MLTT powers if one of your fellow councillors was pushing for it? Uh, I think that would be uh, something that I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't be pushing for um, right now. Uh, you know, as far as housing housing affordability, um, you know, there's so many costs uh, involved in in putting up developments. Uh, we have all these development charges that uh, politicians uh, all around here and all around Ontario are looking at that as free money. Uh, free money to uh, have new community parks and new community amenities. But this is all money that is born on the backs of new homeowners and uh, any new development. So the business community is is getting uh, hit up with uh, significant uh, development charges that, that pose real uh, problems for making things attainable and affordable and whether or not projects go through or not. Uh, I had a business uh, here in Elmira that... Um, that uh, is a, a moderate development, uh, you know, I think it was about 2000 square foot uh, box that he built and there was 100,000 in development charges just uh, uh, added on uh, that he had to come up with. So um, as far as uh, initiatives that uh, are happening in Toronto, I uh, the land transfer tax, I, uh, I I wouldn't be pushing for that in Woolwich Township. I think there's a, as a region we we certainly uh, have can look internally uh, ourselves to uh, make changes. Thank you. And Sandy, do you support the expansion of the MLTT powers to municipalities outside of Toronto? And would you advocate against our community gaining those powers if one of your fellow councillors was pushing for it? Sorry, I hope this is coming through. Okay, I, you cut out a little bit and uh, said my connection's unstable, so I apologize for uh, for that connection. If there's a, an issue with it, um, in terms of in terms of taxation on land transfer tax, um, would be something I would consult with the community on because, uh, as we all know, uh, the property tax system is very regressive. It's our only way of, uh, of, of getting funding to, to fund the things that everyone wants. So um, the, the charges, uh, we can get them from the levy, we can increase property taxes to provide services or not provide services. So I think um, that would be something that I, I wouldn't automatically uh, um, agree to but I would certainly do some consultation with the community on that. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, we'll move on to the next question uh, and we'll begin with Sandy on this question. What do you propose to bring more economic activity into Woolwich? Yeah, thank you. Um, we have a very uh, robust economic community. I think uh, we, re we uh, rely on our small businesses in a lot of ways. Uh, our, our, uh, our large businesses all started as small businesses. So I think uh, one of the things we need to do is support both our international businesses and our small local businesses as they grow and prosper and, uh, and, and employ people. Um, we have an economic development officer who has been instrumental in helping our businesses thrive through the pandemic. It's been a difficult time, as you all know, through, for, especially for small businesses. And she has uh, helped, helped them to uh, get grants and to weather that storm well. So um, uh, she, she has been a, a bonus to the community in, in supporting our businesses. And the other piece is the Waterloo Economic uh, Waterloo Region Economic Development Corp, uh, who are looking at a, a broader picture and a more international picture and bringing people in. So we have we have businesses from small on farm businesses to uh, multinational 
corporations. We have um, Conestoga Meat. We've got Home Hardware. We've got uh, the BioN Power and uh, Enviro Stewards and uh, Ned Law Living Walls. We've got we've got um, um, we've got businesses in all kinds of areas, and and so I think that has served us well and will serve us well in the future. Thank you. And Patrick, what do you propose to bring more economic activity into Woolwich? Yeah, I uh, Woolwich Township is uh, is an amazing township. Uh, we have a lot uh, to benefit businesses, uh, including uh, the international airport uh, that uh, uh, helps and and will future help the uh, employment uh, area in Breslau. Uh, in the future, 50% of the region's employment lands will be in Breslau, and uh, building up that area to support business uh, is definitely going to be uh, a priority. Um, like Mayor Sean said, uh, small business, uh, as we all know, is uh, one of the driving forces of Ontario. Uh, and if uh, I'd like to find more ways that we can transition uh, those really small businesses now uh, because we have downtown spaces that uh, could be filled with uh, some sort of retail and all that, but there are there's a, a thriving uh, home-based business, and it'd be really great if our economic development uh, team could uh, work with those businesses to transition them from the home to a retail. And and there are models out there that uh, that can be looked at, and we could replicate those uh, here in Bullich or uh, across in the region. Um, also, uh, I'd like to see uh, where we we have a, a huge agricultural uh, industry here. Uh, we export and and ship grains and raw materials out. It'd be nice if we could develop a, a, a some sort of a hub where we could take those raw materials and turn them into products and and export those products uh, as locally grown and made products. Uh, certainly, a higher yield. Uh, would come from those exported uh, uh, products than the raw materials themselves. Uh, and also, I'd like to see us partner more as a township um, instead of duplicating uh, uh, services that we may already do with uh, economic development. We partner with somebody like the KW Chamber, and we have mentorships and um, and education programs for people to start their own businesses uh, and, and really foster that uh, small business uh, enterprise and entrepreneurship uh, at, a, at a local level. Um, other things that uh, we need to do, we need to fix our downtown Elmira, uh, which is in the works and make that more people friendly, uh, bringing more people into the downtown core. Uh, we, uh, we need to start from scratch in Breslau to uh, build a, a downtown community for them. And we need to modernize our services uh, at the township uh, to, uh, and, and one of the things we're, we're advocating at the township is to, to the upper levels, uh, the, to the province, is all the uh, massive amount of reporting that we have staff doing, just you know, useless kind of reports that uh, update every year. Uh, we'd like our, our staff doing more productive things uh, for our residents and for our businesses. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. We'll begin with Patrick on this one. The population of the region of Waterloo could reach 1 million residents in 30 years. What are the infrastructure priorities, particularly in rural areas, required to support this growth? Boy, infrastructure is, uh, is a topic of concern for you know all uh, small and mid-sized uh, municipalities. All municipalities are really dealing with it because for a lot of years, uh, they, you know, everything was built up and then there weren't any reserves set, set aside to replace them. We've been at the stage where now we are replacing infrastructure and we have, uh, you know, to the tune of uh, some 70 million uh, infrastructure deficit just in the township uh, when it comes to roads. Uh, we also have another uh, probably uh, $7 million in uh, infrastructure deficit when it comes to bridges. And uh, there isn't a lot of funding uh, that we're, we're being supported by um, through, uh, through the province. In fact, the last uh, four years, the province has been uh, decreasing uh, the amount of money that, that they give Woolwich Township. And, and again, it'll go down again this year. 
Um, so yes, we do have a lot of work. We mostly have a lot of work to do in Breslau. That is where most of our growth is going to happen. Uh, Breslau will be the largest settlement in Woolwich Township by 2050. Um, and so we have to start planning for community amenities, arenas, libraries, uh, all of those kinds of things that right now Breslau doesn't have a grocery store. So it would really be nice that we start planning where those uh, amenities are all, all going to be. And then we have to start putting them in capital forecast so that we can start budgeting and, and start uh, advocating elsewhere to how we fund uh, that infrastructure. But there is a lot of work to do uh, in Waterloo Region and, uh, and, and a lot of work to do in Woolwich because of the amount of growth uh, we've experienced already and we will experience in the future. We are on a trajectory of growth for the next uh, many decades. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Sandy, the population in the region could reach 1 million residents in 30 years. What are the infrastructure priorities, particularly in rural areas required to support this growth? Thank you. Uh, we, we sort of touched on one at the very beginning, and that's our broadband connections is a, is a key piece of infrastructure that we need uh, going forward. Um, growth is a, an interesting uh, thing because, uh, you know, in some ways we want to grow quickly and, uh, and, and, and have the benefits of that growth. But if we grow too quickly, uh, we miss out on having the infrastructure. So uh, we need to try to manage our growth in such a way that we can keep the infrastructure up to date. Things like, uh, like recreation, parks, um, the downtown core. And uh, yeah, the comment that Breslau needs a downtown core is so, so very true. And I've been advocating for that um, since I was on a, a counselor in 2006. Um, the, the, the new uh, plan that we'll be doing for Breslau, uh, I'm hoping that that will uh, incorporate a downtown core and I look to the community to come to the table when we get to that point and um, talk to us about where that, that could be. Uh, they, need, they need a grocery store. They need some retail stores. They need to be, we need to create a community there fairly quickly uh, with those kinds of amenities because the growth is going to continue to be rapid. Um, libraries, um, all the things that, that you would like in a small town. We talk about walkable communities. Elmira is an example of what would be considered a walkable community at this point. You can walk um, within a, a 15 minute uh, radius to, to stores or uh, employment areas. And, and um, I know the region has put Elmira up as a good example of a walkable community. That's what we need to try to replicate in a place like, like Breslau, as, especially as it grows quickly. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, what financial su uh, support should the Ontario government provide to rural municipalities such as Woolwich Township? Uh, Sandy, we'll begin with you on that question. Sorry, can I? It was the financial um, support we would get from the provincial government. Is that? That's correct. Yep. The question. Yeah, we're looking for. Um, we're looking for stays. We keep saying stable, reliable, predictable funding. Um, when we get funding um, that is based on on projects or not uh, regular funding, it's really difficult for us to prioritize our infrastructure projects. Um, so we're we're looking for uh, for a regular funding stream that we can count on, so that when we do our ten year planning for example, for our infrastructure, our road, especially our roads and bridges, uh, we can um, plan appropriately and know that we have some funding for that. Um, the, the, the property tax levy just doesn't provide enough support to maintain all our roads and bridges. We have, uh, with, a, with a smaller population than the cities, for example, and a larger area, we have a lot of uh, bridges, you might not think of them as bridges, even culverts under the road um, that are very expensive to maintain and to replace. And so, so we would look to the, the province for that. We would also look for um, um, 
um, perhaps some other methods of funding. Uh, we've received gas tax money in the past. That's been helpful for specific projects. Um, we've uh, put forward at AMO a, a request for um, a part of the HST to be regularly uh, set aside for municipalities. So there are ways for the government to help us out. The property tax levy is, is just um, regressive. We keep getting downloaded uh, different pieces that we have to maintain and we don't get the funding to go with it. So. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, what financial support should the Ontario government provide to rural municipalities such as Woolwich Township? Well, uh, when it comes to infrastructure, uh, all municipalities across Canada own more infrastructure than any other level of government. And we get the least amount of money uh, to maintain it and look after it and, uh, and make improvements. Um, yes, stable and reliable funding is uh, certainly something we've uh, been advocating uh, at Woolwich Township, especially every year at budget time uh, when we see that it goes down another uh, 150,000. Uh, we were at somewhere north of uh, 800,000 800, uh, from the province and uh, we're down to uh, just a little over 400,000. Uh, in that funding, and it will continue to go again, down again uh, this next budget season. So all of that money in, in Woolwich Township, 1% uh, uh, tax levy is equivalent to about uh, $120,000, $125,000. So, um, you know, that those are the kinds of, uh, that's the kind of money that we're dealing with. Um, through AMO, uh, I, I'm certainly a supporter of their uh, advocacy to the provincial, uh, I guess it would be federal government to, to get 1% uh, of the uh, HST uh, and help fund uh, infrastructure in Ontario. All the municipalities uh, uh, need, need help uh, in this regard. Um, the other thing, when we look at uh, infrastructure and new growth, uh, we rely on development charges, which I don't think is a, is a sustainable uh, solution to uh, providing growth. Uh, but we get the lowest share of the of the development charges. The education and region take the lion's share of those development charges, and uh, we are the ones with most of the infrastructure that people rely on and having to find ways of paying for it. So these are some of the problems we are dealing with uh, in Breslau in particular because there are some big, huge uh, water uh, pumping stations, all that, that cost a heck of a lot of money. And to have that uh, all borne on the cost of uh, Woolwich taxpayers is just, uh, is just too great. Um, so yes, the Ontario government, if you're watching this, uh, we need, you need to send us more money, period. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Uh, next question, I will begin with Patrick on this one. Uh, we talked a lot about the infrastructure projects and economic activity in Woolwich. Uh, how should some of those projects be funded? Uh, well, I mean, we have a lot of infrastructure projects. Uh, right now, uh, for the first time this past budget, we started, uh, you know, staff started suggesting that we need to start to venturing uh, projects, which I'm not a big fan of especially debenturing um, things like maintenance items, like paving roads and things that we use right now. Uh, I really see debentures as something that you would use for a big project, like you know, an arena, a uh, community center, things like that, that uh, you will, the community will be benefiting for that uh, amenity, you know, hopefully for 50 years, and you can uh, spread those costs out uh, over a longer period of time and make those uh, manageable payments. But when we start looking at where we have to debenture uh, road projects uh, and and pay you know be paying for these road project projects uh, ten years into the future when you know you're getting that benefit now um, you know the maintenance and you know is a generally to keep your roads well you want to maintain them every seven years and here you're going to be pay, paying uh, for ten years on uh, on on something that you're going to have to pay again before you're even done paying so. 
right now we have capital forecasts, uh, the money that we do come in with uh, different different revenue sources, uh, gas taxes, uh, the the bit that comes in from the the government, you know, it uh, and then through our our general tax levy, it's all trying to manage within that uh, that bucket of money. And you have to pick and choose projects then uh, at that point. So, you know, again, the 1% uh, HST divided, you know, across uh, all the municipalities, it, it would be a, uh, a huge benefit and go, even if they said this is, you can only use it for infrastructure, that would be great um, because we all have infrastructure issues and, and the issue is paying for it. Um, and just over the past couple of years, uh, paying for infrastructure got even more expensive. Almost every one of our projects uh, that that we have on the go was way over budget, like significantly over budget. Uh, so that's a problem. And, you know, this next budget is going to be, uh, we're going to have to make some tough decisions for sure. Thank you, Patrick. And Sandy, when it comes to uh, how to fund some of these projects, how, how would we go about doing that? Yeah, thank you. Funding's always uh, always on our mind. Um, one of the things that we did a number of years ago, um, quite a few years ago, was instituted an infrastructure levy. And part of the philosophy behind that infrastructure levy was that it would provide us um, some finances to partner with other levels of government on projects. And so I think of the Glasgow Street Bridge, um, the West Montrose Bridge, um, there have been a, a, a number of, of projects where we partnered with other levels of government and it's been a, a one third, one third, one third or one quarter and two thirds, um, <laughs> three quarters shared with, with others. Um, so, so the infrastructure levy has helped us in that way to to um, to to leverage, I guess, our our uh, ability to do some of these projects. Uh, yeah, we've talked about gas tax. We've talked about possibility of HST uh, debenturing. Um, I, I don't have a problem debenturing for specific projects. Um, I don't like debenturing for regular maintenance kind of work. I think we're probably on the same page there. Um, but uh, for for major projects uh, within reason, I, I don't mind debenturing. It's like uh, taking a mortgage on your house. You, you take the mortgage so you can have what you need right now and you pay for it over time. Also, um, the... the uh, if it's a project, if it's an infrastructure piece that's going to be enjoyed by future future generations, say um, that spreads the cost of that over the people who are going to be having the enjoyment from that piece of infrastructure. So, so I don't mind debenturing within reason. You have to be careful with increased uh, interest costs and so on that uh, that that it you manage your your budgeting correctly. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, we'll go on to the next question and we'll start with Sandy on this one. Do you support a new Highway 7 between Waterloo Region and Guelph? I could chuckle and make a joke about that. <laughs> We've been talking about it for 60 years, I've been told. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't remember from when I was five, but <laughs> um, do I support it? Yes. Yes, I, I've, uh, I, I, I'll be honest, I don't drive that stretch of highway regularly, but when I do, especially at certain times of day, the, the um, backlog in traffic is uh, considerable. Um, I think, uh, you know, as we go forward, we're, we're going to need to find ways to connect our communities. And I also think that the, the all, all day two way go uh, will be important to connect us not only with Guelph, but with uh, Toronto and, and Pearson. And so I, I think we need to, uh, to look at a, a number of uh, different ways to, to connect our communities. And um, I understand that, um, you know, we're hoping to reduce the, the, the traffic volume of automobiles by providing some other kinds of transit, um, but we're also electrifying vehicles. And so I'm not sure that uh, will reduce 
the number of vehicles enough to uh, to eliminate the traffic issues that are on the current Highway 7. Thank you. Patrick, do you support a new Highway 7 between Waterloo Region and Guelph? Uh, short answer, yes. And uh, longer answer, this is uh, an important uh, corridor. Definitely important for uh, Woolwich Township and Breslau for uh, uh, growth here. Uh, you know, already uh, the inaction uh, that's happened on Highway 7 has uh, caused uh, lands to that were uh, slotted for certain amenities for Breslau to uh, recently uh, jump ship. Uh, it's really unfortunate. I, um, but we do need that uh, Highway 7 corridor open. Uh, the amount of employment lands uh, that are going to be in, in Breslau and be a bit of a, there's going to be a, a, a certainly an economic uh, boom in, in Breslau for uh, large enterprise. We need we need transit that uh, that that is going to work and not have gridlock. And so uh, a new highway uh, through that corridor is certainly welcome. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, we'll move on to the next question and we'll begin with Patrick on this one. Many small businesses have been severely impacted by the pandemic. What financial assistance programs do you propose to keep these operations viable? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, because I'm a small business owner, I uh, uh, when the pandemic hit uh, within uh, the first couple of days, uh, we dropped uh, 150,000 in uh, contracts uh, almost overnight. Uh, it was uh, pretty scary for our situation. Uh, the way things were going, didn't think we would last uh, a couple of months. And uh, without uh, support from the federal government, uh, you know, my business would have been uh, definitely uh, not uh, survivable. Um, so with those uh, CERB uh, payments, uh, and there was uh, some, some other uh, incentives uh, that, were, that were brought along, uh, we uh, managed through the uh, two and a half years and have uh, come out of the other, other end and uh, still intact. And uh, and and on an upward trajectory. So you know we're you know from a personal standpoint uh, certainly pleased with you know our our performance uh, going through. Now everybody didn't uh, have the same uh, opportunity because I, uh, my business was deemed an essential service. A lot of businesses weren't and were shut down for uh, for months and months uh, without. Uh, knowing when they could get back and and you know took on a lot of debt uh, over that period um i as a as a, a small as the municipality uh woolwich we uh, had a uh, we we had a a, a 0.5 or it was some somewhere around point point five uh levy uh that was a covid uh, relief uh that ended up helping uh, more of our grassroots organizations uh, rather than individual businesses, but there was opportunities for uh, businesses to apply uh, for some of that funding to uh, to get them through. Not a lot of money, though, uh, to uh, to go around uh, for that kind of assistance. Um, as a region, we certainly need to uh, look at you know our economic development people um, and uh and 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 provide you know promotion promotional opportunities uh for businesses the whole uh shop local <clears throat> promoting the products uh, that we make and build here are all uh certainly things within uh our parameters of that that we can do um so uh yeah off the top of my head those are those are some some <clears throat> certainly some supports uh, that the municipality can do and the, and the region can do. I'm not sure about uh, bailing, uh, being able to bail out uh, uh, certain uh, businesses uh, when it comes to, you know, then you're into picking winners and losers. And I'm not sure that's uh, the role of the government. Thank you, Patrick. Sandy, many small businesses has been, have been severely impacted by the pandemic. What financial assistance programs do you propose to keep those operations viable? Yeah, thank you. It's difficult for, uh, for municipalities, for the, the, the cities, the especially the townships, uh, to provide a lot of financial assistance. Um, 
I, th I think most of that has come provincially and from the federal government and uh, lots has been said on that. Um, what I am hearing from small businesses is, is they're having trouble finding employees. And these are, these are the businesses that are maybe struggling a little bit more coming out of the pandemic. They're having trouble finding employees, particularly in the food services sector. Um, and they're having trouble finding housing for their employees so that they, they may um, have some uh, immigrant populations that they can tap into, for example, uh, for as employees, but then they can't find housing for them. And that ties into, again, connecting all the dots because it ties into transit, for example, um, getting to the township uh, from where they may live. So there's a whole lot of pieces that I think are part of that struggle for small businesses coming out of the pandemic. And um, in terms of, of actual financial assistance, I'm, I'm not sure there's a lot we can do at this level in that regard, but we can certainly help with, uh, with continuing to try to, to provide affordable housing with um, trying to provide a transit where we can uh, for advocating for their, their employees and, and for the, uh, the things that they need. And I would say, um, if we're talking about local, there's a country harvest dinner tonight uh, that is all local foods and local, um, local chefs that are doing it. So that's happening in St. Jacobs. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, that concludes the question portion of the forum. I will now uh, move to concluding remarks from uh, both candidates. Uh, Sandy Schantz will provide a one minute closing response followed by Patrick Merlihan. So Sandy. Okay, thank you again for the opportunity to discuss your questions of interest. Politicians have been known to make all kinds of promises and maybe or maybe not deliver. That's not my style. The pandemic has taught us that we're not always in charge of the agenda that's put before us. But what I have done and will continue to do is listen to all sides of each issue and balance those points of view with consideration to the bigger picture. If I were to pick the top three areas of concern as I continue to lead the township, they would be building safe, accessible and healthy communities, addressing the environmental crisis, and finding adequate housing at all levels. With that mindset, together we will prosper and find our way through this key period of change, this unique point in time where we are setting the stage for the future of the township and the region. We punch above our weight in Woolwich. I look forward to working with the business community and all our government and citizen partners as we continue to work collaboratively toward the goal of creating a township where we are all respected and all prosper. I am Sandy Schantz, and I ask for your continued support as mayor of the Township of Woolwich in the upcoming election. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, we'll go to you now for your closing remarks. Okay, uh, thank you to the, uh, the chamber uh, for hosting this event. Uh, some of the best companies in tech, manufacturing, agricultural, and small business have made Waterloo Region their home for good reason. The spirit of enterprise, the abundance of an educated workforce, and great communities to live in all contribute to our success. I think local government can do better in fostering and growing business opportunities here. And Woolwich Township will be home to half of the region's future employment lands with more being added in Elmira as well. It is going to be important that servicing moves quicker than the traditional response times. We need to be able to come up with viable mitigation responses to affordable housing, promote and incentivize trades, transit, support doctor recruitment efforts and provide quality daycare solutions. All of these efforts are required to support a thriving local economy. Through the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, they advocated for a 1% share of the HST to help fund municipal infrastructure. I support this effort <clears throat> because our current system to fund municipalities is not sufficient. Growth is being funded through development charges, which increases costs on businesses and residents, which sometimes make development unattainable and unaffordable. Developers are paying $250,000 in fees <clears throat> and community service before they start purchasing materials or paying people to build one house. This is not a sustainable model and is directly contributing to, affordable, to housing affordability. 
I'm a local politician with a business background that recognizes and understands the intricacies and frustration of dealing with government. I make myself available to businesses of all sizes to understand their concerns and look to seek solutions through staff and council. I look forward to working with you as partners within the region and finding ways to motivate government up to the speed of business. Thank you, I'm Patrick Merlihan, and I hope that you will vote for me on October 24th. Thanks. Thank you. On behalf of the chamber, I'd like to thank all candidates for taking time from their busy schedules to participate in this forum today. If you're a resident of Waterloo Region, the municipal election date of October 24th is rapidly approaching, so please ensure you're aware of a voting location and other options. The chamber hopes this forum has provided some relevant perspectives on your issues of concern. Thanks to everyone and have a great day. Hi everyone, and thank you for viewing the Greater Kitchener Waterloo and Cambridge Chambers of Commerce Candidate Forum for Chair for the Region of Waterloo. My name is James Sebastian Scott from City News 570, and I'll be moderating the discussion today. The Chamber would like to thank the newly formed Waterloo Region Association of Realtors for their support of this event, and we trust the upcoming exchange of policy positions will assist you in making informed choices around your vote on October 24th. The format will include questions on issues of particular concern for businesses and employers across the region. However, we do expect that all viewers will find the content informative and engaging. We'll now commence one minute candidate opening statements through alphabetical order. After a series of questions following this same rotation, one minute closing statements will be provided in reverse order. Our candidates joining us today is Karen Redman and Narayan Datsukram. Karen Redman will provide an opening statement. So I too would like to thank the chamber um, and you, uh, James Sebastian, for this forum. You know, when we think back to 2018, who could have predicted uh, what would unfold? The past four years have been challenging, and I'm proud of how the Waterloo Region responded to the pandemic and ma managed the vaccine rollout while continuing to move forward with sound investments for the future. The region matters to each of us as business people, as families, and as a community. And how you see yourself in the region greatly matters to me. The region led by its council sets goals for the future. We make things happen through partnerships, visionary leadership, and our diversity of voices. Together, we work towards building the best community we can be. So you can see how being chair of the region is a significant role. As your chair, I respect the trust you've placed in me and I welcome the opportunity to continue to lead the conversation on identifying the region's priorities for growth, prosperity and social responsiveness. I've frequently been asked what is the big issue in this election? And I can tell you they're all big when you're in the middle of them. Certainly housing affordability, attainability and homelessness are complex problems requiring long-term solutions with partners across the community and at all levels of government. From my perspective, this campaign is about leadership and the ability to plan for the future and also to respond to that which cannot be predicted. I look forward to discussing a range of topics with you. Thank you, Karen. And uh, Ryan, we'll begin with your uh, opening statement now as well. All right, thank you for having me. So my dear fellow listeners and viewers, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Narayan Datsukram and I live here locally in the region of Waterloo. It does not matter how long you live here, but I've lived here almost 30 years. I educated myself here locally and beyond. I currently hold over one dozen university degree, including a leadership and master of social work. And, and I'm currently finishing off my doctor of social work, specializing not only in leadership, but also um, in clinical work as well too. I believe that a regional chair position has to do more with the leadership skills that we have. Well, Ronald Reagan once said that politicians are not the solution, they are the problem. So I want people to um, listen to this debate very keenly because as much as leadership experience is important, I have the, the, the right kind of leadership that is important to move this region forward without any question. I believe that my almost 30 years of grassroots contribution to this community at the grassroots level working with a variety of different people and you know, with a variety of different project are all solid pieces to lead um, this region. So I look forward for this debate. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll now begin the question portion of the forum here and Narayan will begin with you on the first question. 
Based on your recent discussions with voters, what is the priority issue in this election? Well, one thing I can tell you is that my conversations started off not since when I put my name forward um, for this um, regional chair position. It started off years ago. And one of the biggest things I'm hearing is the disconnect between the politicians and the people and poor leadership. When I talk about poor leadership, think about it. We have 75% of the regional councilors are leaving, right? And so poor leadership, disconnect um, between you know, the politicians and the people. Obviously, we know about it, uh, pieces about housing and homeless and so on, but there's nothing much we can do moving forward if we don't have good leadership to bring a team together so we can work on those pieces as planned. So that's what I'm hearing. Disconnect, um, um, disconnection, you know, between the people and poor leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, what's a priority uh, issue in this election that you've been hearing from voters? So I was in Elmira yesterday knocking on doors and it was environment. It was a sense of place. It was the relationship between area municipalities and the region. It was looking, um, I hear a lot about healthcare. I hear a lot about the school board, which neither which are the purview of regional council. But, you know, I cannot not comment on the, um, the speculation as to why long-term councillors are not seeking re-election. We have had an amazing council. Nobody could have predicted what the last four years have been. Many of my council colleagues are choosing not to run again after 30, 35 years of providing public service. Um, and I would tell you in a, an, an exemplary way. And a lot of them have uh, reflected on the fact that um, new voices, more diversity, a council that reflects the demographics of our community are the things that they are promoting. And they're going out and they're knocking on doors of um, young female candidates, uh, black candidates, and trying to um, make sure that our council continues to work forward. But I, I think it's disrespectful to dismiss these decisions. Um, the, a lot of the colleagues I have that aren't running again really did a lot of soul searching because they recognize how very important the role of regional council is and the difference that we make in the lives of the people we represent almost the next day. And those are businesses, they're the community, we're helping shape the future. There has been a lot of very hard work done and None, none of these individuals uh, made that decision lightly. And, and I commend them for building a very solid foundation from which we can move forward and continue to do investment in the future. Thank you, Karen. I will move on to the second question. We'll begin with Karen on this one. Uh, many small businesses across Waterloo Region have been severely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, including mounting debt levels and staffing shortages. What assistance should the Region of Waterloo Council and all municipalities provide to these operators? So I have to say that I am absolutely impressed with how the business community stepped up during the pandemic. And I look at the formation of Best WR, and that was the presidents of both of our chambers of commerce that was represented as Communitech and Waterloo Economic Development. And they provided a lifeline and input for um, supplies of PPE, letting mm -hmm. people know um, and the regions um, supported um, bundling and buying of PPE when it was very scarce. As we go forward, there have been provisions made by the federal and provincial government for businesses. I know that during the pandemic, um, I was on a conference call with a lot of local um, restaurateurs. And while they were worried about their individual investment in their business, they were truly worried about the mental health of their staff who were being whipsawed into working for a couple of weeks and then not working and having to apply for um, CERB. So what we did as a community um, is the region invested money, about uh, $60,000 in mental health supports that um, businesses um, could direct their staff to apply for. And it, throughout the region, all of our uh, counseling services provided uh, group uh, mental health and individual mental health uh, services for people. So I think there's a lot of ways that ec through economic development, we can continue to meet the needs of individual businesses. But I think as far as um, 
tax relief, those are things that we have lobbied and will continue to lobby the provincial and federal government for. Thank you. Uh, and Narayan, what assistance should the region of Waterloo Council and all municipalities provide to small businesses who have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic? So I think that it is important for us to educate businesses that when you are advertising a product or service, make sure that you are providing and serving to that standard. So for example, I try as a local citizen here, I try to shop locally as much as I can. And I went to the farmer's market and I shop. And I was excited to buy some garlic. When I came home, the garlic says um, came from China. So that is a problem. So I think the education piece, we have to educate people that if we, we want to support um, local businesses, they have to make sure that they are um, doing things that represent what the people want. That's one thing. But also, obviously, we will have to continuously work with different levels of government. Let's not forget here that we have um, several MPPs <laughs> and several um, MPs in the region who have promised to do a lot of uh, uh, pieces for the businesses. So I will think that it will be part of my role, not only to work with them and have a coffee, but to hold them accountable so that the businesses can flourish, can flourish moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Narayan. Uh, next question, uh, we'll begin with Narayan on this one. Uh, currently, Toronto is the only municipality in the province that has a municipal land transfer tax. The additional municipal tax is a significant barrier for people trying to get into the market, particularly for first-time buyers. Over the last several years, there have been municipalities that have tried to give themselves MLTT powers. Do you support the expansion of those powers to municipalities outside of Toronto? And would you advocate against our community gaining those powers if one of your fellow councillors was pushing for it? Yeah, so for me, let's not forget here that I'm running for regional chair. And I don't operate in a way where I make decision on my own. A leader should never make decision on his or her own. Um, as I've been looking on the website of all the regional councillors, it looks like they have the solution for everything. So if I was to get it, my job will be easy, <laughs> right? Because they have all the solutions. So what I will be um, doing, I think it is important as a leader, I think it's important for us to recognize our own skill set. I have my own unique skill set. And I, as a leader, I have my weaknesses as well too. But I always believe that when you can recognize your weakness, it is an automatic strength. I will, the first step I will, because being a leader is not about me anymore. It is about the people, what's, what they want really. And my first thing will be having that conversation with the, with the, reg reg with the regional council to, to see, um, not, to know not only of their ideas, Right, because if we are listening only to their ideas, it means that we are just doing things based on how we see fit. Because at the end of the day, we are representing the people. So for me, it's um, getting a sense as to what is it that the people want. Right, that's that's the bottom line, and then take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Narayan. Uh, Karen, when it comes to the MLTT powers, uh, would you export, uh, support sorry, the expansion of those powers to municipalities outside of Toronto? And would you advocate against our community gaining those powers if one of your fellow councillors was pushing for it? So James, I really appreciate the question. And I would have to tell you that Toronto has the Toronto Cities Act. So they are a, sort of a different animal than the rest of every other municipality in Ontario. And they have many authorities that the rest of uh, other municipalities don't. There is only one taxpayer, and I would have to tell you that there are some um, things in the Toronto uh, Cities Act that um, would be nice to have in the region of Waterloo. This is not one of them. There's only one taxpayer, and the reality is um, we work at the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, which is a provincial organization, as well as through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, to make our voice heard, to say that... Um, there is only one taxpayer and we have to be responsible in how we budget and, and what our taxing authority is. It's interesting that Minister Clark has just announced um, and had proclaimed the Strong Mayors Act, and that only applies in Ottawa in the city of Toronto. Um, the devil is always in the details, so we look to see what the Strong Mayors Act actually um, entails, but I would have to tell you, I'm happier to have strong cities and strong regions. And I think when we work collectively, always representing um, the best interests of um, our constituents. So that is the best way to go forward. So I would not support this particular aspect of the Toronto Cities Act and look at um, 
other ways that we can encourage investment in building affordability of housing and a variety of mix of housing. And it is one of the things, again, that I would, I've talked to people at their doors about, and that is the regional official plan. We have recently, probably about a month ago, referred our regional official plan to Minister Clark um, for his comments. And being able to bring that local lens and those priorities to how we move forward for greenfield expansion, for 15 minute cities, for complete cities so that you can live, work, um, go to the pharmacy and buy groceries in, in your neighborhood, uh, no matter what corner of the region you're in, whether it's rural or urban is really, really important. And I think those are the kinds of things that I continue to advocate to the province to say it's very important that our voice is heard and that we have that local autonomy for planning. Thank you, Karen. Uh, we'll go to the next question and begin with you, Karen, on this one. Uh, what do you propose to bring more economic activity into the region of Waterloo? Great question. And you know, I would have to tell you that during the pandemic, the region of Waterloo, our almost 4,000 um, members of our staff continued to work towards the investment in very large infrastructure. I think of the King Victoria Transit Hub. I think of Two Way All Day Go. We're getting there. We're not there yet. The investment and the partnership in the Breslau Go Station with Metrolinx. We have uh, had a historic expansion investment of $35 million into the airport. All of that connectivity is very important so that we continue to attract investment and talent into the region. We also have the east side lands and we're looking, um, I just came from uh, WISA actually, which is an organization in partnership with the University of Waterloo, um, the airport and uh, Nav Blue, and it is looking at uh, sustainable aeronautics. All of these things continue to keep us on the cutting edge of implementing technology. We're all gonna to continue to fly, but we need to do it smarter. And we always need to have an eye on our footprint in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You know, in addition to that, we saw the opening and investment of $123 million into the bus maintenance facility on Northfield. That allows us to service articulating buses and electric buses. And we've invested in installation of charging stations. It's smart growth, it's planned growth, and it's focused to, again, uh, continue to move forward so that we can be the world-class community that we know we can be. Thank you, Karen. And Narayan, what do you propose to bring more economic activity into the region of Waterloo? That's right, good question. You cannot be a world class region if you don't have a safe um, um, region, right? So we have seen crime is going up and so forth here, right? Despite the fact that we have the chief um, all, uh, is making almost $400,000 a year. So the thing is, if we are able to do our piece to make sure that our city, our region is safe, there wouldn't be any need for us to knock on doors to bring people here to, to, um, to, you know, to operate their, their business here. We have to create um, you know, ourselves in such of a way that people will be coming to us, not, not, not we going after them. We go after them because people are not coming to us. And so for me, start with a safe and uh, it's, it start, with, start with a safe city where people feel safe. The thing is, you do not hear people talk about these, these pieces. They try to put it underneath the rug. So for me, you start with safety. Um, and on unless we clean out all of this mess, people wouldn't want to do, um, do business here. All the other pieces, um, we can work our way around it without any question. Thank you. Thank you, Narayan. Next question, uh, the population of the region of Waterloo could reach 1 million residents in 30 years. What are the infrastructure priorities required to support this growth? Narayan, we'll begin with you on that question. So first of all, when you're leading a region, you cannot do guessing game here. So we keep hearing that, you know, the, the, you know, the region will grow, we'll have X amount of numbers coming in, right? So the way I've seen it, most politicians, most people, they are looking at the glass to be half empty, right? They are not looking at the glass to be half full and that's a problem. And so for me, it's about recognizing and try to do an assessment to understand who are the people I'm coming in here? Are we just seeing the negative pieces and say, oh my goodness, people are coming, we have to find them, um, we have to have, find them a place to live here. 
or are we going to try to figure out and see what skills are they coming in the, the region with, right? What resources are they coming in with, right? And we, we assess from there. We have to make sure that we understand who are the people coming in, how long they're coming in here for, are we just going to come for a year or two, um, and, and so forth. So without doing a proper assessment, we cannot do anything else. We cannot say that, okay, we are going to do this and we will try to build, you know, several thousand of homes and so on. How, how do, do we determine that? If we are going along that path, it means that we are working in a blind spot without any question, without realizing it. So that's how I, I will tackle it. Analyze the situation first, see who is coming, um, focus on, on the resources, don't rely on a small circle of people to solve the problem, right? Thank you. Thank you, Narayan. Uh, Karen, the population of the region could reach 1 million residents in 30 years. What are the infrastructure priorities required to support this growth? So James, I, that is the question of, of the moment. I would have to tell you, uh, the region of Waterloo is poised to build our share of homes um, that are part of the 1.5 million uh, target that the provinces set out uh, in 10 years. As a matter of fact, we have over 35,000 units in the planning process at different stages. And the regional official plan accommodates that kind of growth and that growth will, and employment and growth and employment land will happen in all four townships and all three uh, urban uh, settings. There is no doubt that the three absolutely outstanding post-secondary education institutions we have, have for decades attracted bright young people that have enjoyed the, the quality of life and decided that they would make the region the home and their home. And that's not going to um, change anytime soon. What we need from the province is investment in schools and infrastructure. We need a new hospital. And we need to, again, have those completed communities so that people can buy groceries, go to the pharmacy. And we've invested in active transportation so they don't have to always rely on their car. All of these things add to the quality of life. And we need to be vigilant. It was interesting yesterday, the University of Waterloo School of Architecture in Cambridge unveiled their project of tiny homes. And I think our history in our region has been built on great ideas, bright young people, innovation, high tech, advanced manufacturing, and then the ability to bring that kind of um, innovation to the marketplace. So I thought the tiny homes was a really interesting um, variation on how we continue to build housing. But there is no doubt that accommodating a million people by 2051 is going to require the efforts investment of all levels of government. Thank you, Karen. Uh, next question, uh, we'll begin with Karen on this one. Uh, what financial support should the Ontario government provide to the region of Waterloo? That's pretty easy, James, more. <laughs> I would have to tell you that um, my experience in government has taught me that governments like solutions. They want you to go with to them with a focused ask and be able to demonstrate the result of um, what that ask will be. You know, homelessness in the unsheltered encampments are a topic that I hear about in the media um, and I hear about at the door. And I would have to tell you the investment in the House of Friendship on Weber Street, um, giving wraparound service in a different model, the outstanding leadership that um, Bridges has um, brought to housing people. During the first wave of the pandemic, 80 people who were then living unhoused found permanent housing. We have to go to the government and say, we need investment in shelters and interim housing. We need more money for outreach workers. We need more money for healthcare providers and partners so that they can provide the mental health supports. So it's being focused and asking for things that we know will make a difference. And that means doing your homework, listening to experts like outreach workers, like our partners. It needs, um, we, you know, we need the development community to be part of any solution going forward, whether it's housing or um, making sure that uh, we have the kind of shovel ready land so that we can attract uh, investment. So it definitely speaks to going to the government with a focused ask and with your research done. And we do that at the federal government. Uh, we do that at the provincial government. And don't forget, 60% of all services delivered at the municipal level are delivered by the region. 
So the social determinants of health are huge for us. Ontario Works is. Uh, we are the manager for um, shelter, for childcare, and we need that partnership to be funded by the provincial government for those services as healthcare. It is both uh, provincial and federal that we will go to them for dollars. Uh, a new hospital is something that um, everybody is talking about. I'm a huge proponent of um, healthcare being delivered in the community as well. So we have lots of challenges, but we've got a lot of very smart people working on what those solutions look like. Thank you, Karen. Narayan, what financial support should the Ontario government provide to the region of Waterloo? That is a good question because um, not everybody has the experience working with a very small budget. And that's what set me apart here because working for a nonprofit and profit as well too, you know, and working for small businesses and so forth, you, you basically work with very small, with a very small budget and you make things work. One of the things I would like to say here, it is easy for us to talk about homelessness and so forth, right? Because that's what we are seeing, right? Example. The common example, we talk about a situation by um, um, Weber and, and Victoria. One thing I would like people to know here as a clinical social worker, and this might be of surprise to you, believe what I'm saying to you here. My clients, none of them are homeless people. They are police officers. They are vice principal. They are teachers coming from mental health services. And I think it gets overlooked. We have to remind ourselves that we cannot feed off an empty bucket, right? I would have not known have I not, um, um, not risked myself, but kind of challenged myself to get into mental health because mental health has never been my thing. I avoided it for, for many years, but that was part of my way to try and close the gap rather than reading on a piece of paper. And so I start to look at things differently now because for me, seeing um, homeless people down the street is an opportunity for us to do some deep self-reflection because how the heck are we going to help the homeless people if we ourselves need that help? It's, it's, it's very sad. To come back to the question, though, and I'm almost, almost finished here, I think it is important for um, regular um, families and so forth to have that support, to have permits and so forth to be approved much faster. I took on a project um, a few years ago to turn a bungalow into a legal duplex. So I understand the whole process and it was such of a long process. See, um, you know, um, inspectors will come. They're not sure if they should have, if they should pass it, not pass it. They're not sure of, of, of all of these kind of pieces. So it was, it was such of a long process. Another thing I, I would suggest as well too, is that we need support um, where everybody can be part of the solution. Meaning that for me, um, when we are building houses now, I think it should be automatic where we are putting in a side door to have access to the basement for future use. In fact, um, 11 years ago when I built my home, I was thinking along the line uh, because I, I'm, I'm, um, you know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm an outside of the box thinker, so to speak. I paid a thousand dollar extra for put the side door to make my basement, you know, um, a usable space, and I'm glad I did. So I think we need to start to to think along those lines and not to kind of put the band-aid on top of, of, of another band-aid. It doesn't work like that. We need to look for long-term solutions. So th that's, those are the direction I'll take. Thank you. Thank you, Narayan. Uh, next question, uh, we'll begin with you, Narayan, on this one as well. Uh, do you support a new Highway 7 between Waterloo Region and Guelph? Absolutely. I mean, we talk about the population, you know, <clears throat> will grow. And we all know that study shows that. In fact, believe it or not, not anymore, I've did my share. I commute to Guelph for 10 years back and forth, right? So I, I, I see the need, I understand the need because I've been there. Um, and the fact that the, 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 the region is, you know, is growing, absolutely, I do support it. I think that's, 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 that's not, um, um, that's not um, um, you know, something that um, mo you know, more, most people will kind of go against because keep in mind, I talk about the housing piece that I've done really, right? And that's just an example. We have to look, look ahead. So my, my, my answer to that is absolutely 100%. And how will we do it? I mean, we really can do, like I said before, um, running for regional chair is not a one man show. We really have to, um, you, you really have to have, a, um, you know, you, 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 you cannot rely only on political experience. I think that's where we fail because as I mentioned earlier, 
Ronald Reagan once said that politicians are the problem. They are not the solution. You have to have people with passion. You have to have people with a drive to make it work. So yes, that's my response to the question. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, do you support a new Highway 7 between Waterloo Region and Guelph? I do, and I would have to say, I think most people are scratching their head when the land assembly was made uh, decades ago and successive uh, governments, including this current provincial government have said that it's a priority. But um, I would also add that I think two-way all day go completion, the, the uh, go uh, um, transit hub and King Victoria hub also provide the alternative of public transit. and. Um, a line coming from Cambridge into Guelph um, is really important too. So yes, I support completion of, of the highway, but I think we have to continue to give viable alternatives for public transit to um, residents. Thank you. That now concludes the uh, question portion of the forum. Uh, we'll now go into closing statements. Uh, Narine, uh, you can begin your one minute closing statement. One minute. Come on, James. Um, <laughs> um, my dear fellow listeners uh, and viewers again, thank you so much for joining us and thank you um, for inviting me here. Um, I was not invited previously, so I do know I appreciate this very much. You know, um, we live in a different time here. And the bottom line is we really have to um, start to think differently. And that's how I operate professionally with my um, clients, because if they're doing the same thing every day, I cannot change anything about their lives. Their lives. I'm just there to kind of guide them. At the end of the day, they have to make those changes, right? But I'm there to guide them. And I've seen lots of successes. What I'm saying here is that we as individual, obviously, we have the kind of mindset, right, that we are going to do things a certain way. This time around, I'm asking you to kind of have an open mind, and an open heart as well too, and, and kind of dig a little bit deeper. Do know that you have a choice here this time around, right? Um, think about it. You have to have somebody who's passionate. There's a reason why this time around, we don't have too many people running. Last time around, we had quite a few people running because it was an opening spot. Ideally, if I, if I really wanted to get in, I could have easily run for regional council. I would have stand a better chance. I don't operate that way. Right, um, I have really good leadership skills, which is important. I've, I was, I have it through my academic pieces. I have over a dozen university degrees, and these things needs to be considered as well too. Right, um, having only political experience doesn't really give you the real understanding of working with the everyday people, and that's what the difference is. I want you to think about it that way. And remember this one thing that I keep saying, because it is so true. Ronald Reagan once said that politicians are not the solution. They are the problem. Think about it that way. Do check out my website, though, narain.sukram.com. And to Karen, do know I appreciate you. Um, I actually was responding to the question from the beginning based on what I'm hearing in terms of gap. This has nothing to do with you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen, we'll go to you for your closing statement. Thanks, James. Um, I continue to appreciate the opportunity to serve you and our community as chair of Waterloo Region. It's a distinct privilege to have your trust. I come into this election with 20 plus years of experience in building service through elected uh, office. I also served as uh, CEO of Habitat for Humanity Waterloo Region for seven years. I come into this election with skills that I have developed over the years, and they've enabled me to navigate an uncertain time, collaborate with local businesses and area municipalities, as well as to advocate effectively on the region's behalf to other levels of government. It is through effective leadership, authentic partnerships, and forward thinking that the region continues to grow and prosper. And it is through strong leadership that big ideas turn into reality. Municipal government has a direct impact on all of us and offers the opportunity to build and shape our community for the future. Voting is important. I encourage you to make a commitment to your community's future by participating in the municipal election on or before October 24th. I respectfully ask for your support. And again, thank you for inviting me and thank you to the viewers for joining us for this panel. Thank you both. On behalf of the Chamber, I'd like to thank everyone for taking part 
uh, in this forum uh, from their busy schedules to participate. If you are a resident of our region, the municipal election is October 24th and it is rapidly approaching. So please ensure you're aware of voting location. The Chamber hopes this forum has provided some relevant perspectives on your issues of concern. Thanks everyone and have a great day.